Hello, I'm Anthony Jackwin. I'm back home in the UK after a fantastic trip to Brazil recently. I was speaking at the High Brain Institute's Brazilian Hypnosis Convention. It was a huge event, hundreds of people attended, and the host, Alberto Rizenje, was kind enough to put myself and most of the international speakers, as well as a number of Brazilian hypnotherapists, up in Rio in, a, in, in an incredible house uh, in Barra. Now, while I was there, I got the opportunity to spend some time with Cheryl Elman. Cheryl is the wife of Larry Elman, and between them, they're very much keeping the legacy of Dave Elman's work alive. I had an opportunity to have a conversation with her one evening and ask a whole bunch of questions I'd always wanted to ask about Elman, and she did a brilliant job of, of, of providing me with answers and really does tell a good story. So I invited Cheryl the next day to kind of have that conversation again, but to do it on camera for the benefit of everyone who's got an interest in Dave Elman's work. She answers questions about his early life, with his parents, what they were doing, um, how he got into performance at a young age via vaudeville. She talks about his very first encounter with hypnosis and, and why that had such a deep impression on him. The, the, the bookcase, the, the notes that he created for um, his later work with doctors and dentists and all sorts of other stuff too. So it's a really interesting interview and I just want to express my gratitude to uh, Cheryl and to Larry for also providing us with some pictures and samples that we could kind of uh, help illustrate this interview with. So thanks again to them. Enjoy the interview and please share it around, make comments, ask questions. Really appreciate any feedback if you've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Hello everybody. I'm pleased to say that I'm here with Cheryl J. Cheryl. Elman from the Dave Elman Hypnosis Institute. Have correct. I got that right? That's correct. Great to meet you for the Great first time. You. Great to meet you too. We started having a bit of a chat last night and uh, I thought we'd just, it was so fascinating, I thought we'd pick it up again. I'm All right. forward to it. Great. So um, first off, just tell me a little bit about yourself and your involvement with the Dave Elman Institute. I met and Larry, uh, and married Larry Elman 16 mm -hmm. years ago. Almost. Okay. So this is Dave Elman's son. Dave Elman's son. Yep. And I really knew nothing about Dave and the hypnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry and I were actually doing a mobile arts and crafts company down in Florida. And when he started telling me stories, because he's an aeronautical engineer and retired Air Force Colonel, yep. and I was hearing all these airplane stories, I said, wait, I don't want to be the only one to hear all these stories. So um, he, we, we, created a 100 years of flight division of our craft company. Right. And this is what we were doing when we first moved up to um, to um, North Carolina. Okay. And then when the market crashed, yep. um, it just happened to be the time that Sean Michael Andrews found us. Right, lovely guy, I've met him and a couple of times. He wanted, he, he researched the internet and found us in Florida in a craft company and Larry was doing computer repair earlier for several years, right. and um, and backtracked and found us, and immediately asked, "Can he come down and interview us?" Right. So he like got in his car from Maryland and came down like the next day, okay. within a few days, and he and and that's how um, I, it was the first time I knew about the whole hypnosis thing. Right, right. So was Larry aware? how legendary his father's reputation had No. Been. No. I mean, he knew that books were selling. I mean, yeah. uh, well, he knew that people were interested because he'd get some inquiries occasionally. Yeah. Um, it was when we went to our first convention in 2009. Larry was invited as a speaker after we met with Sean and Michael Andrews, and, and um, by then I had also studied it because yep. uh, I got interested. and. And it, 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 that's when we realized how more iconic. Yeah, iconic. It was. Kind of. I, I mean, yeah. re very much so. And we just looked at each other. No yeah. idea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. A few hundred years of 
hypnosis and maybe three or four icons that people really will kind of gather around and yeah. Dave Elman's one. So when Larry started to then speak, was he, was he, was it a historical piece? Was he talking about stuff he'd seen and heard as a kid or was it stuff from Dave's book or what? It was a combination. Um, he actually studied with his dad. Uh, actually, it was his mother and his father, just like we travel the world and teach together and work together. So did his, did his mother D and Dave his Elman, father. They right. were a team, okay. Pauline and Dave Elman. Okay. And in fact, you, there were stories that sometimes the doctors would line up more in front of Pauline right. than in Dave okay. to get checked out because they would say that she was the better teacher. Wow. <laughs> and, and you say Larry trained with his dad. Did, he, he did that quite young, right? Yes. He was about 11 years old and he asked his father if he could you know, take the class and his father said, well, that would be okay, but you got to go read this book. Okay. And he had some really difficult books he had to read, but Larry was an avid reader, still is, 20 bookcases worth. Okay. And um, so he was given these books to read and write reports on because his dad said, well, you're going to be studying with doctors and dentists, and there's no way that you can come in not knowing anything. Right. So, so he was 11. He was 11 the first time he took it. Yeah. And between there and when he was 17, yep. he went to MIT. Okay. And in between that, he took the course three times. Right. Which was interesting because he got to see the evolution of the methods. Okay. Right. Fantastic. And after that, he was a military man and a, a colonel. Did it just sort of fall away for a few decades? Or? He used it some in MIT uh, with test anxiety and friends. Okay. Uh, he used it on himself. I was really, oh, I guess the first time I really knew about it was he was going to a nutritionist in the first year or two of our marriage, and she had actually studied with Jerry Kine. Right. And so she had a diploma. Mm -hmm. And then she looked at Larry's name and said, is there any relation? So, you know, she was just so amazed. Yep. And she was having some issues and asked Larry to hypnotize her. Right. And so I was like, you're going to what? <laughs> so, and um, he was comfortable to do that? He was comfortable. Right. And um, so, and that's how, through the years, when he went into the military, there were, he was under a commander that really, you know, saw it as a tool of the devil. Right. So he did not really use it. Yep. You know, he probably used a lot of waking hypnosis through the years, mm -hmm. but actually like having a course, you know, having somebody sit down and do sessions with him, right. you know, was not that often. Right. And since then, I mean, some of the details you were sharing with me uh, go further back than the publication of the book and the training right. at adopters. So... You mean Dave's... In, in terms of Dave's now, yeah. So, so is there a, a point you can kind of kick sure. off with there? Sure. Dave, Dave was born out in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Right. And large family, and he learned everybody in the family played music. Um, uh, they, uh, he just fell in love with vaudeville. So okay. when he was out there, now how so did so he vaudeville get to, to someone that doesn't know is that like a was, music hall type? Actually, vaudeville was like a traveling troupe. So when you were out in, in the West, I mean, yeah. there was still stagecoach. He was born in 1900. Right. Stagecoaches were still going through his town. Right. You know, and so when he would, um, uh, vaudeville would be where it was a small town, small city. So similar to a circus that would travel. Right. So would a vaudeville troupe. Okay. So they would go to different cities and they would entertain. Yeah. For a week or so, and then they would move on to the next. All right. And um, and it was. Actually, the reason vaudeville died, a good reason, was when movie theaters started coming up. Okay. They didn't have to pay this whole, and feed, and, you know, this whole troupe. Sure. You had one kid up there, you know, right. just showing the movie. So, so, Dave Elman was an entertainer at that point. He, he was. But now, how did he learn about hypnosis? Uh, right. His father was a hobbyist. Okay. Uh, Jake, uh, actually, his name was Kopelman. Yep. Jake Kopelman. Um, was a hobbyist in uh, hypnosis mm -hmm. and he was uh dave had gotten to go with him in his childhood and watched his father 
hypnotize somebody for stuttering. Right. And it took while she was in hypnosis. Okay. But uh, upon um, emergence, could not keep the suggestion. So right. even though he had the how to do it, he didn't have the nuances of learning how to have that suggestion stay in the post state. Yeah. So uh, his father had, when he was eight years old, I think it was when his father died, and he, okay. he had cancer, mm -hmm. and somebody came by, he was, in, he was bedridden, he was in a lot of pain, somebody came by and had him, uh, and, and helped him with his pain. My guess is, being that he was in a, an industry where he would travel and he was selling lace, perfume, you know, some of the things, where would it be? It would be at bars and brothels and yeah. some of those. So I uh, I know Gil Boyne thought it was Henry Monroe that had stopped by and okay. helped him with his pain. Um, I think it was Barry Thane, we were talking about him, yep. that figured out that he didn't feel that that would have been along the same route. So I don't know who stopped by, right. but somebody stopped and helped him with the hypnotic pain to the point that the next day he was able to leave. Okay. And when he left, uh, he went to go collect from some, and he was able to play with the kids, and that's why it stuck out in Dave's mind. Right. Not as much that he left, but that he was his able father's to play, back and, and he able could to play with engage. them. And his dad died on the trip. Okay. And uh, so, um, so he continued living out in Fargo, and when he was in his mid-teens, mm -hmm. he went and joined a vaudeville troupe. Right. So in a vaudeville troupe, um, you, he played instruments, he played sax and violin, mm -hmm. he uh, told uh, jokes, he right. would do Jewish humor, you know, with white face, and there's a picture of him, you know, reading a Jewish newspaper with in, in white face, right. um, he, and he would do hypnosis. Because the more things that you knew how to do, the more likely that you would continue having that job. Right. So uh, and everybody... Do we, and do we know much about what that hypnosis would have looked like? Was it a row of chairs and the, the traditional kind of stage act starting to appear? That I don't know. But right. before that point, yeah. when Dave first took over, sorry, I'm going back and forth That's a good. little. But when Dave first took over the um, his dad's hypnosis library, because his dad right. had books, um, and he was reading, he kept, a lot of people use more like progressive muscle relaxation. You know, it took a while to sure. get into hypnosis. And, and, and were they there? Yeah. So this was all part of his thoughts. So he started developing the idea mm -hmm. of working on that Dave Ellman induction. And what he would do is, um, he went to an ophthalmologist in town. Mm -hmm. And in, with that ophthalmologist asked, what is it that when he reads about hypnosis, so much of it had to do with the eyes. Right. And so the hypnotist, I mean the ophthalmologist explained to him that the tiring of the eyes, so much happens around the eyes, the tiring of the eyes. Right. It, uh, um, uh, because we are actually made to uh, not stare, we dart, our eyes dart sure. because we were hunted. You okay. know, in, a, in our They do, they evolution. track around constantly. Right, yeah. and so by making them stay still and focused, mm -hmm. it would tire the eyes, tire the body, and your body goes with it. Okay. So using that, and, uh, and that he also realized that every time somebody got hypnotized, they got, uh, they went deeper the next time and faster. So right. it was that practice concept. Okay. And so his idea was, well, if you're gonna bring somebody this week, and then have them come back next week, and each time they're gonna go faster and deeper, why not just keep doing it right there? So, and so fractionation was fractionate. long. It's not great necessarily for the economics of a doctor's office, yeah. you know, who wanted them to come yeah. back each week, and also to have them coming and going from the waiting room. But that's the idea of fractionation, which I don't think that word is in his book. I think. Uh, right. He used it, he used uh, three trips to Bernheim because it was actually uh, Herpolity Bernheim that he got that concept okay. from Fascinating. about each time faster and, and quicker. Brilliant. So and and did that that little shelf full of his father's books still exist somewhere? Or <laughs> uh, you know, we have recouped a part of it, mm -hmm. but uh, and but uh, the whole library did not get to come to Larry initially, so yeah. um, 
and so we have recaptured part of it. Okay, so, so we, we're, we're at Vaudeville. Yep, and so he was yeah. doing, and the as, what do you need in stage? You need them to be able to go in quickly. Yep. So he actually practiced in when he was a kid, he practiced on his schoolmates, yep. you know, but, um, and, and that's how he kept practicing the DEI. Okay. And, um, and he would do it in stage. And when he got to New York, um, when Vaudeville died, he got very interested in radio. Right. So he would do all these different jobs. Oh, and I forgot to tell you last night, in there, he also was writing music for WC Handy. Okay, was that like movie maker? He was maker? A, a big blues okay. and jazz right. musician and company. Mm -hmm. And most people that wrote for him, wrote music for him, did not um, get to have their name on it, but he, there's several pieces. So he clearly he contributed a lot there and yeah. got the acknowledgement. Yes, right. he wrote, uh, do you remember the, or remember the name Eddie Cantor? He was a comedian in not America. Really. No. So he wrote his uh, theme song. Okay. So one of his songs became his So theme he's song. deepening his talents and he's yep. now kind of creating for other people. Yep. Is, are there any stepping stones between there and How Dave Elman training doctors? It's, it yes. still seems like quite a gap. There was a gap. Yeah. Um, he would occasionally do a benefit, a charity benefit. What happened was uh, my um, my husband had an oldest, br the oldest brother, mm -hmm. their firstborn, died, and they were grieving so much. Yeah. A friend of Dave's said, "You love radio so much, you need to." to pop out of this, go ahead and create a radio program that nobody else has done. Okay. And that's when he created Hobby Lobby. All right. So, so, he, so, so he created that show himself, he didn't just appear on it. Yes, he created and it. And was he the host? He was the host. Right. Uh, and it was a radio program and uh, they had sponsors and uh, we have recordings of quite a few shows well. um, that still exist. Uh, Larry's birth was announced twice on it. So I think the first one, I know uh, the one, one of the ones we have was the week after Larry's birthday. So it was December of 1938. Wow. That, because they re-announced his birth from the week before. Okay. So, and it was a national program. So it was fascinating. He, what's, and, and this also helped to culminate his hypnosis skills because what are you doing you're listening to a radio program mm -hmm. people are coming up with their favorite hobbies right so in those ha favorite hobbies um, they the studio audience is getting to see what they're demonstrating mm -hmm. but the radio audience na nationwide is not hearing it uh, not seeing it mm -hmm. so Dave was very good at taking what he was seeing and reflecting it back mm -hmm. you know to make it so interesting to the audience out there. Right, right, brilliant. So did he do anything hypnotic other than sort of rounding off his skills and you know presentations generally? Did he did hypnosis feature in Hobby Lobby? Um, Hobby Lobby, there was, a, um, you know, there was a lot of risk of you've got radio audiences, so if you're hypnotizing okay. people on air, yeah. there could be some ramifications. Mm -hmm. But they did have one that was, um, that a radio pro, uh, program where there was a hypnotist okay. and he didn't do a very good job. Right. So Dave asked if he could, would they listen to him if he took over? Right. And so it, the guy said, yes, you know, and told him the next voice you hear will be Dave Elman and ran off the stage. And they were, and he did a great job. Right. And he had them and, and did a few different things with them and afterwards, his wife did not know anything about the hypnosis. Okay. So Larry likes to say that, and he, you have to see Larry demonstrate it, but basically the hands on the hips, because Larry was in that audience that night mm -hmm. when that occurred. And, and, it, and his wife, Pauline, was like, well, Dave, can you please tell me why you knew more than the hypnotist that was there? <laughs> and so Larry, as a child, uh, used to dust his, make money, like a nickel, yeah. uh, a, a nickel a shelf, I think, for dusting his father's bookcases. His father was a real history buff, as okay. my husband is, and had his hypnosis library. 
but nobody saw that because he had people and stars and right. coming. That was behind his other books. There was so Larry right. charged his dad double because there was books and then there was books behind the books. So right. he would charge him these two shelves, <laughs> and when he would dust it. So that was his hidden. Because back right. then, when we look at the old books, mm -hmm. it'll sometimes have a receipt in it, or mm -hmm. there's a st stamp where it was gotten. Where do you get yep. hypnosis books that time along? Right. Where do you find them? Mm -hmm. They were in occult bookstores. Okay, so it's. Yeah, it was sort of. Yeah. So he had it behind mm -hmm. him, and as um, he did, how how he that branch or that bridge to the doctors yep. was he would sometimes do a chariot, uh, a charity benefit. So is this. He Most of us have just heard Dave Elman used to be, you know, was originally a stage hypnotist. So we sort of, he after did Hobby Lobby, did it start to move into, you know, traveling around doing shows or, or, or not no. so much? Right. No, he never went back to stage hypnosis. Okay. He was on stage a lot. Yeah. You know, uh, he also had, um, not only was he on stage for that during the war, during World War II, he would do... Uh, war bond auctions and victory bond auctions mm -hmm. where people came and brought interesting things or donated things and then they were bid on and people had to pay with them with war bonds or victory bonds right. which helped raise money for mm -hmm. the effort mm -hmm. so that he was doing that too he was doing a, he did a benefit for a group and some doctors approached him afterward right. so that that was a stage show that okay the so he did a he did, did, did a benefit charity right. benefit because that was he, was by then a star, right. you know, having been on radio for many years, okay. a, a star in his own right, and so he would. Do, he, they invited him to do a charity benefit. Okay, and then the doctors were looking for what to, to, to increase their just, knowledge or tell it, come and tell us about they it. They just said, "Wow, what you did, and you had those people in hypnosis so quickly. This is what if we were to use hypnosis in medicine, this is what we need to do." because we only have a few minutes with a patient. Okay. So we don't have the time yep. to do a long induction and they yep. loved his fast induction. Sure. And asked and so asked if he would present to them and that slowly turned itself into a course. Right. And from that he they taught for years going around the country. Okay. Teaching just doctors and dentists. Okay. So that's prior to his book. So I guess if he's created a course he's creating some notes some materials that kind of stuff yep and, yep. and as they did that uh, the doctors were doing the field testing so right. you know he was always back then they didn't have what highways so he was teaching in six or seven cities at a time mm -hmm. when it was a single circle so mm -hmm. every week they would do the whole milk run come back to the same hotel so they they would get mail at the different hotels as they went Mm -hmm. And then they would go ahead and um, uh, redo that for ten, a total of 10 weeks. Right, brilliant. And do any of those materials exist, like his original training notes or course notes, things like that? We have uh, the reference notes that, um, that were given to the doctors. Wow. And uh, we've seen a few renditions of them. Yep. Um, he had records that he would give the doctors or they would buy, mm -hmm. which would help them review or augment. Sometimes it was something they could use with their patients. Sometimes it was just education. So literally some vinyl. And these were vinyl right. records. So they some weren't publicly were available. These were materials to supplement his, the course Or they notes. could be bought. Okay. But they weren't in stores. Yeah, you sure. had to know about the course. Yeah. And so they were uh, 78s and then 33s. Right. Okay. So, uh, um, and we do uh, have that, some of that material. I'm going to hopefully, we're going to get to put in a couple of little <laughs> clips of that. Yeah. But they incredible. had things called Relax Seducer, Obstetrics, The Magic Fairy, you know, right. uh, which was for pediatrics. So it was really interesting to see. And the doctors would come in going, I tried this, and this is what happened. And, you know, I wanted to share you this. Mm. I did this with my. Uh, patient and it worked out so well so he would actually have this big Rolodex the old Rolodex was yep. before the phones and yep. the contacts and they would call doctors in the same specialties from other cities and ask them right. to go ahead and field test yeah us. we tried this give yeah. it a try and, and 
Yeah, and report mm -hmm. back. Okay. So that's what that's uh, what how the Amazing. force kept growing. Yeah. Because when they asked him to teach, he goes, "I don't know medicine." Mm -hmm. And and they said, "You just teach us the hypnosis." Yeah. And and the more uh, he would walk around with his big medical dictionary, mm -hmm. and he got to learn a lot through the years working right. with all the specialties. Okay. And I mean, some of the accounts in the book, which seem to stem f from demonstrations in front of doctors or maybe Correct. maybe dentists, they're incredibly direct demonstrations of pain control that, that even now for most hypnotherapists, there's, there's, there's barely anything there. You know, it's so direct, open your mouth, it kind of directs attention and then goes right. to work with some tools. C can you sort of discern how that evolved or was it during this kind of process doctors had requirements and they would come up with something for them right um just seems a big leap I from stage hypnosis to digging tools into someone's gums with confidence be, uh, going for the and i don't have the details larry can probably give you a little bit more of that right. uh, on that particular issue yeah i know working with esdale mm -hmm. that was um something that uh you know, getting to Esdale on purpose, he figured out how to get. So Esdale, out. we're talking about a state. Uh, the state. The, deeper, the Esdale state. Deeper than the yes, yep. Esdale uh, state or what they call the hypnotic coma. Also, right. um, that that was something he had learned to come up with several techniques to bring somebody out of it. Because as a stage hypnotist, if somebody dropped into a natural Esdale, right. uh, you did not want to get stuck being in jail until that person came up. Okay. So learning how to bring them up and out was like important to them over the years. Right. Uh, and they would just, uh, they it just kept growing based on what the doctors were bringing to it. It was really a collaboration. Right. And so he learned and he learned a lot about medicine as he okay. went along. Okay. Just from being involved in it every night. So how many years did that continue for with the Okay, training so I think that the first doctors he spoke to, I th I'm thinking, was in 1949. Mm -hmm. He had his first heart attack in 1962. They were out in California. Okay. And he got, had a heart attack. And they were basically couldn't do that. I mean, that was, they were traveling every day to the next city. They would teach again at night, going to the diner till sometimes 1, 2 o'clock in the morning with the doctors, mm -hmm. going and sleeping, getting up around 11, 12, and driving to the next city, yep. and so this is what they did. And was it know. providing them with a, you know, a, a decent living at that time, or was it more, you know, just a love for this subject and a need to share? It was probably a combination of both. Right. It, uh, it was, he made, he made a lot of money with Hobby Lobby, Okay. but he also lost it. Right. Because you remember when 8-Tracks came out, and 8-Track um, tapes, and cassette tapes came out at the same time. Mm -hmm. And eight track tapes, if you put all your money into the development yes. of eight tracks, right. you're lost. Right. Well, he did some something like that in technology radio. He did not feel that TV was going to get right. so big so quickly. Yep. And so syndicating how the radio programs get to everywhere quicker was some technology he made a, a big investment in. Right. and lost. So Larry grew up on this in this humongous mansion in Summit, New Jersey. Yeah. I didn't believe him until we went and saw this mansion. Right. And right. Uh, it was bigger than the one we're in. Right. And um, and uh, but when he was about eight, his father lost that. Right. So okay. uh, so but Hobby Lobby gave them a living. I don't know. How, I can't tell yeah. you. He did not have the popularity in his lifetime. Yeah that he, d I mean, within the medical, but he was always marketing. Yeah. Um, so, and the, when he had his heart attack, he had recorded, he had actually recorded the whole course in different cities. In, I'm thinking 19, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly the years, probably between 57 to 60, but I don't, I don't have that exact sure. thing. Sure, sure. And uh, what happened was uh, those became a set of records. Right. Sometimes uh, they've been copied, 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 and sometimes they were copies that he, um, that the, uh, some of the doctors themselves recorded. Sure. You know, but 
the technology back then in the 1950s, you know, I remember my dad's reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Yep. The technology, the microphones, they were not so good. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, you can't always hear what's going on in the room. It was very unidirectional. Right. You know, we didn't have things like this on our, uh, sure. on our lapels. Yeah. It was this big yeah. equipment. Um, so, so are there, you know, other record or things, things in the archive, audio and transcripts that have never been published or seen the light of day, or have, has most of that stuff emerged now? No, I think, I, I think there is, and it's interesting. Somebody sent us a box with some recordings that I think came from possibly a doctor. Okay. Uh, and there's transcripts which I've never had the time to really look at in loose leaf notebooks right. that somebody transcribed. Incredible. So I've, uh, one of my goals is this year mm -hmm. to do a little less traveling. I'd love to write a book that then could be translated. So Larry yep. and I wrote Brilliant. a book that, can, that had a lot of the Dave Elman information in it um, and, and our own interpretations as we've been teaching and culminations of other people that they've shared, yeah. you know, what they've done with Elman. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the Omni take on it. Uh, we have an interview of Larry and, and Jerry talking, right. you know, and, and using bits and pieces of that. Uh, the book was written, he wrote the book after his heart attack. Okay. So the book was written between 1962 and 64 when it was first published. Mm -hmm. And I think parts of it and a lot of the transcripts of the um, of the demos mm -hmm. came from probably the records. Yeah, sure. And then he did a lot of studio work on the records too, where he would actually teach part of the lesson, and then it would be in the classroom, and he had the doctors okay. doing it. So and it was interesting. And then uh, he died. I and, and when the book came out, it was called Findings in Hypnosis. That yep. is the original book. Right. Um, then in after his death. I'm thinking, I don't know if it was exactly after that, but somewhere between, in the, maybe in around 1970, yep. um, my mother-in-law, Pauline, um, didn't like, uh, it was too hard for her to do the publishing and stuff herself, mm -hmm. so she went to a company called Nash Publishing. And they, were, they made her promises and she didn't feel that they were really doing a good job. And then that book was called Explorations of Hypnosis used the same uh, back then you owned your plates so right. they had their own printing plates of right. this 300 something page book yeah and so uh, the books are the same except for the uh, the uh, beginning you know the forward and the okay uh, and, so and there was the no, he wrote a table of contents he did not write an index he didn't want people to be able to just look something up he felt you should read the whole right. course kind of thing uh, and then when when um, in 1978, 77, mm -hmm. 78, Gil Boyne approached my mother-in-law. Okay. And that's when the book. So had uh, Gil became, Boyne studied with Dave Elman or, or not? You know, I'm not a hundred percent clear on it. Okay. I don't. I don't know. Okay. I know that Dave was invited to speak, and again, I don't have all the details about mm -hmm. this. Um, he was invited to speak at, a, I'm thinking it was in Florida. Right. And, uh, to, and he was not, um, it was not a positive experience for him. Right. I don't know if Gil was at that event. Okay, but Gil was, by, by the 78, Gil was an established hypnotist and trainer and perhaps recognized the legacy or the yes. potential of, of the of book. Of the book. Yeah. And, uh, and, and um, so he, he got the use at, and he's been publishing it. Right. And still today, John Butler continues through Westwood to publish it. Right. So even that third version, bar perhaps the forward and the, the index is essentially the same. Well, the index didn't exist right. until Gil took it over and that's when the name became hypnotherapy. Okay, incredible. So Gil added the index. Right. Which I myself find it easier yeah. to be able to go quickly and find something when yeah. I'm trying to reference it. And uh, I, I said to you, I had one exchange a few years ago online with Larry. There's a bit in the book that still jars many hypnotherapists, however much <laughs> they love it, where right. it's essentially suggested that hypnotherapy is not an effective means to quit smoking. 
So what does it take to really quit smoking? You need a motivated client, mm. and you need faith in, and, and mm. trust in the hypnotist. Mm. And the hypnotist has to have the confidence that, of course, they could do this to be able. So all yeah. those pieces need to be together. Yeah. You have somebody that loves smoking. If you find pictures of Dave Elman, there's always an ashtray right. or a cigarette there. Mm. So the one picture of him hypnotizing the cigarette is right there, you know, he's got her hand up and the cigarette is right here. Yeah. And I have that faded out on the back of my business card mm. and put words over the cigarettes, right. you know. And um, so he never truly really wanted to give up smoking. He okay. smoked till the day he died. Um, so he couldn't do it on himself. He was trying to do it on himself. So there he had a client, not motivated, a hypnotist that really wasn't that motivated. So a student to do it. of his or uh -huh. A student of his well, had a first go? he was trying to do it himself, but then right. he had a student do it. But but again, if you don't have faith in the process mm -hmm. or the fact that it could even happen. Hmm. Sure. If, if, so, yeah. yeah, had he done that, had he had the faith that of course hmm. it worked, that feeling of just telling somebody, close your eyes, yeah, and have them just because of the expectation mm -hmm. of how great he is, because doctors would bring patients with them or wives yeah. and they would tell them this guy is the best yeah you know, so he so had the prestige and authority right. and all that stuff right so yeah. there he was with this expectation this guy was the best mm. so lots of times they would just say close your eyes mm. you know? well now i know he had a cigarette in his hand most of the time yeah makes more sense there's another moment in the book where he hypnotizes via cigarette. three puffs on a cigarette yes um, catalyst yeah yeah. Crazy stuff. You know what's really interesting about the catalyst? Mm -hmm. He used to, so the catalyst induction was one where they would take three puffs of the cigarette and the person would be out. Yeah. The interesting part of it was that, um, that after he would do that, he would have the doctors in the room use the catalyst induction, right. using something else in the room. Okay. And as it went around the room, nobody could repeat. Right. what somebody else had already done. Yep. And so they had to be very creative, showing you that anything could be a can catalyst do it, yeah. I mean reduction. It, yeah. And if you think about it, same thing as deeper. Yeah, I mean, even on my uh, training DVD, I teach a few different versions of the handshake, and one I reference Dave Elman as the kind of triple handshake. Right. It's just an a adaptation of this, this catalyst induction. Exactly. So it's still going. That's good. Exactly. Um, okay, so someone, someone shared a short snippet of Milton Erickson recently talking about Dave Elman. I've heard it. And it sounds like Erickson has read Dave Elman's work and perhaps spoken to people he's shared his techniques with. Was Dave, it sounds like he was an avid reader, so, so was Dave aware of Erickson's work and what was hap happening or was, was um, it just too early I guess? Dave was aware of Erickson and right. his, Erickson, um, Dr. Erickson was not happy that Dave was teaching doctors. Okay. Um, it was who he was also teaching so he's sort of in a way So that was from a competitive point of view? Uh, from right. a competitive point of view. Dave would do mailings to doctors and he had actually invited Dr. Erickson, because I guess Dr. Erickson was talking in very negative terms about him, right. and he invited him to come to the class to see. Okay. And so, no. Did that happen? Did no, you heard. He, he asked me to come. Oh, yeah, okay, that's, that that's it. Right. That I'm aware of, they've never met. Right. Um, and I think uh, th there was, and I don't, know if it was Dr. Erickson or somebody in his training field mm -hmm. or something, but they used to call uh, call the house or, you know, Larry with the child. Uh, they would try to get Dave for practicing medicine without a license. Okay. It's like, so there was, I don't know if it was sour grapes or just the competition or, yep. you know, he fe felt, you know, even organizations today, if you're not a doctor, a dentist, Same, a yeah. psychologist, you know, mm -hmm. a lay hypnotist, you yeah. know, um, that uh, you're not invited to be in that group. Well, okay. I guess part of that was, so, but Dave, that's one of the reasons I think he only taught 
doctors and you know within right. the medical because that's who originally wanted it anyway. Right. I think he'd be really surprised and find it so interesting the conferences that are out here today. Yeah. You know, um, and all the different people. Yeah, and we're often still trying to unite this direct and indirect you know path to, to hypnosis and it's not even direct indirect as much as credentials because you could be right. using you know and dave ellman was not always authoritative if you think about or and so was milton erickson sure absolutely was extremely authoritative yeah. so it's it's the tonality it's it's so much aspect and it's working client-centric dave ellman's methods were very client-centric okay you know um milton erickson worked it's hard to, I think, for somebody to duplicate uh, Milton Erickson. Sure. I mean, it was like his being. He told those yep. stories. It was like yep. he was there in trance with them, you yep. know? And I think, um, so I don't know that much about that, but I just know that Dave Ellman's stuff was uh, not script related. Everybody wants the magic words. Yeah. That's why Larry and I go out of our way to teach the Dave Ellman inductionist process. Okay. Right. And um, because it's not the words, it's knowing the process and what you're looking to achieve. Mm -hmm. The Dave Elman induction is really great because it has testing already. In that's there. the tests and convinces. That's that why I'm a big advocate for it because it has built in testing. Uh, I think we can sometimes question, you know, how rigorously people are testing that. Is it actually amnesia? Or are they just losing the will to speak at that point with the numbers and stuff? But then varies. do you stop at that point or I mean, yeah. as a hypnotist, don't you find you deepen with that? You're always deepening on, and repositioning and stuff within sure. your session. Yeah. So if you're just ending there, mm. you know, if it's not or you're not sure, mm -hmm. then you're just deep and depending on what you want. You don't always want somebody so deep. Yep. You know, if you're doing a lot of conversation, it depends on what you want for that session for that client right. or where it's going. Yeah, very good. So you've obviously fallen in love with the subject. I have. Yeah. And what's your practice? You know, what, what's, what's kind of, you, where, where's your attention focused right now? I see clients in North Carolina mm -hmm. uh, for hypnosis. Um, I also have added in, I come from education. I'm an educator. Okay. Uh, I have a degree in special education, elementary education. Uh, I have done a lot of psychology courses along the way and um, also, um, m my ex-husband was an alcoholic drug addict, so I, I did a lot of work within it, addiction, yep. you know, and codependency myself, and all that stuff comes through. Before I even did that for years, when I talked to friends, they'd say, oh, you're putting your shingle up, you know, and this is before I ever right. studied it. So I think there was just always a piece of liking that conversation and helping people mm -hmm. by asking them questions and having them help them Mm -hmm. sells through. So I met in 2011, I met Joan Goulding okay. from, um, from Australia who developed Sleep Talk for Children. Okay. And coming from a process, a coming, I think as a hypnotist, we have, if you treat or work with children and, 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 and it gets alleviated and they improve and you're sending them back and the part of it comes from the environment Mm -hmm. that lots of times there's a lot of backsliding. Yep. So if there were something that, uh, a process that could then help families to help make that switch, to help change the, the relationships and, and the things from within the family. So Sleep Talk for Children, actually, you don't work with the children, you train parents to talk to their children in their sleep. Great. Two to three minutes a night. And okay. I just what is they drifting off to sleep? Or it's just when they're sleeping, a okay. certain time during the sleep cycle. Yep. And so what I loved about it is when um, that it, it's good for children with special needs. It's good for children, with gifted children, yeah. any child. Yep. You know, biggest shift comes Hyperactive, with the they're now asleep. Let's yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 it, you're not putting them to sleep. It's the positive suggestions you're giving them within their sleep that are okay. carefully formulated. Right. Um, and you've obviously seen some great results with I've this. I've seen some great results. Right. And uh, Joan Goulding originally um, uh, created it for her own special needs daughter. 
when okay. she was eight. Okay. And, um, and she couldn't, she was, even though her husband was a hypnotist and mm -hmm. she was a hypnotist, uh, they couldn't, it was illegal to do hypnosis in right. Victoria. Okay. So, and, uh, and she, you need focus, you need, you know, them to be able Concentrate, to Concentrate. Yeah. Yeah. She wasn't going to do any of that. Yeah. So they started yeah. to talk to the subconscious within her sleep. Okay. And that's how it developed and it kept, she kept improving over the years. Mm -hmm. So it's a great process. I, so I've been doing a lot more of that mm -hmm. because um, I, I wanted to cut down on my travel, but we still have to be open. As yeah. you know from traveling, yeah. it's a little difficult sometimes to have, you get your practice all going and then sometimes we're on the road for two to three months at a time. Right. And so then you get back, it's like you're starting all over again. Sure. Uh, I personally am not as comfortable doing or don't like doing hypnosis as much over Skype, although I've done right. it. But I love doing the sleep talk for children. Okay. So I have clients globally. I train globally in it. Right. So I, I, for me, I'm doing a bigger concentration on that, mm -hmm. but still teaching the Almond with Larry. Brilliant. Um, and we visit classrooms for trainers all over the world. So if okay. you are training people and you wanted to have a Skype in and say hi and Sounds talk to awesome. them. Sounds awesome. I'd love, I'd I love to, to do that. P I love to do the DEI for groups overseas. Like So right. in your classroom, I would do it in there will be a hypnosis. We'll, as a group we'll make that in. happen. I appreciate yeah? it. Yeah, 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 I'd love to do that. So, it, so um, we're here at this Brazilian hypnosis convention. It's going to be big. You're speaking on Sleep Talk? I'm talking on, uh, speaking on Sleep Talk. Speaking, <laughs> speaking on, on Sleep Talk, yeah. Okay, fascinating. I can't hear. wait yeah. to hear more about that. Yeah. Just to give people a little idea of, of the basis of it and, and, and how it can improve. Brilliant. Well, look. Thanks so much for your time. We could probably ben. do this another three, four hours. I could right. do, definitely, definitely <laughs> dig into a few more details. We'll speak again. All right. Yeah, Thanks so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye.